The sun shines with an ominous orange glow, and the dry air fills with a smoky tinge. This was a scene in 1995 atop Mount Vision at Point Reyes National Seashore. It was a fall day, October 3rd, at about 1.30 in the afternoon. The park hadn't had any recent fires, and we were somewhat unprepared to deal with the large fire if one had occurred. Some teenagers were had an illegal campfire up at Mount Vision. The fire got out of their fire rings when a gust of wind hit it. And when that gust of wind hit it, basically the fire just started spreading. What could have been a fire that we could have extinguished within an hour rapidly spread to 300 acres. At that point, fire engines, aircraft were being summoned throughout the state. The Mount Vision fire quickly raged out of control. In just three days, more than 12,000 acres burned to a crisp. Almost like a sea of fire. Imagine the ocean. Imagine just a sea of red coming at you. That's what a high intensity fire would be like. Unfortunately, the Mount Vision fire is not an unusual story. In an average year, more than 400,000 acres go up in smoke in California. A lot of the dangers that we face in Northern California, we're gonna face every year. We have a Mediterranean climate. It rains in the wintertime, fuels grow. In the summertime, it dries out, and we're gonna, we're gonna have fires every year. There's, there's no doubt about it. Firefighters have their hands full. Each year, the California Department of Forestry, also known as CAL FIRE, responds to over 5,600 wildfires. They've gotten to know fire well, but recently, they've seen a change in its personality. Now the fires are very volatile. Uh, they get up into the canopy of the trees, uh, kill the trees, kill the brush. Those type of fires make it extremely hard for us to control. A large blow-up that crowns into the tops of the trees can release as much energy every 15 minutes as the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. These fires grow to tens and hundreds of thousands of acres. Uh, they create their own weather systems. Uh, they have flame lengths 300 feet tall, the size of 30-story buildings moving through the forests. These are just almost unstoppable forces of nature. So what's created this growing problem? Surprisingly, it has a lot to do with humans putting out fires. Smokey the bear, Smokey the bear. 100 years ago, in a move designed to save the woodlands and protect our natural resources, the U.S. Forest Service adopted the policy of 100% fire suppression. So remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Smoky Bear, Only You Can Prevent Wildfires, did a lot to highlight wildfires, the threat of wildfires throughout the 1900s. A lot of people really learned a lot about fire from Smoky Bear. Uh, unfortunately, his message is misinterpreted to mean that all fire is bad, which it absolutely isn't. Over millions of years, forests and grasslands of the West evolved with fire playing a crucial role in the health and growth of the ecosystem. But by taking fire out of the equation, we've disrupted the balance of nature. Fire is just as important in the forested landscape as sunlight or water. The trees need it. And prior to our suppression, the fire would come through and actually rejuvenate the ecosystem. It would move through, clear out the dead vegetation, the dead brush. Certain trees require fire in order for their seeds to pop out and plant the next crop of trees. When we came in with fire suppression, we interrupted that natural cycle. We still have this sense of fire as something that is dangerous, something that is to be avoided. It's a catastrophe, it's an inferno. But the reality is fire is absolutely integral to this land, this landscape. And without fire, there would be none of this. Jeff Coffey is an expert on California native plants and an environmental writer who was one of the first to chronicle the effects of the Vision Fire. The week after the fire, it burned for about four days. Everything was just a wasteland, black but actually it was a wonderful thing. And we saw regrowth almost immediately. Seeds were just waiting for that fire to come 
And finally, when the fire did sweep through, it opened up the landscape to the sun and it caused the seeds to germinate. And the landscape was covered with these blue lupins and yellow lotuses. And uh, then of course the butterflies came in profusion to feed on these, these early succession plants. One of the main beneficiaries was the bishop pine, whose seeds are only released when extreme heat opens its pine cones. So here's a bishop pine cone. Look how it's all sealed. Then once a fire heat opens up the cone, you can see how what we call the wings have opened up and the seeds will drop out. Without fire, those bishop pines won't replicate themselves. Twelve years after the fire, these trees are thriving and a healthy ecosystem is on the rise. When the bishop pines came up, it was like turf. They were so thick, it was like walking on a carpet. They're all in competition for the available resources of sunlight and water, and so it is really uh, literally a jungle out there. The life cycle of the forest is shadowed by the vicious cycle created by fire suppression. It's a catch-22. As we smother wildfires, the forest becomes unnaturally overgrown. Some areas now have up to 10 times more trees per acre. While more may sound better, it increases the chances of disease and insect infestation. And it leads to fuel buildup and a greater likelihood of a large catastrophic fire. When that occurs near communities, it requires further suppression, continuing the cycle. So how do we reverse the cycle and get back to a more natural state? One way is to go in and manually thin the undergrowth. When we go in to conduct a thinning project, our goal for that is to restore the forest back to a healthy level. Uh, that means there not only needs to be fewer brush on the, on the ground, fewer small trees, but there needs to be a diversity uh, within the forest. That way it can serve its purposes not only for reducing fire danger, but also for providing wildlife habitat, having healthy ecosystems, watersheds, and all of the other kinds of things. But this approach is fraught with controversy. Thinning a forest of undergrowth is extremely expensive. Logging companies will do this for free if they are allowed to cut some of the larger trees in payment. But environmentalists oppose this idea, saying that might increase the fire risk and by chopping down the big trees, we lose the very thing we are trying to preserve. In addition, thinning wouldn't help species like the bishop pine that need fire for new growth. So land managers are increasingly using fire as a tool. A prescribed fire starts with us uh, looking at a section of the forest and uh, realizing that it needs fire in order for it to be a healthy forest. An area first has fire line put around it before the fire's ever started. That way we have a uh, good control over the fire. And one of the methods might be for firefighters walking through with something called a drip torch, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a torch dripping fire as they walk through the forest. Uh, it creates a low intensity fire that mainly burns right along the ground. Uh, other methods uh, can be as extreme as uh, what we call helitorching, which is a helicopter carrying a giant drip torch underneath it, dripping fire throughout a large area. Or there's a, a thing called a plastic sphere dispenser. Uh, this is a helicopter flying over an area, shooting out little tiny plastic spheres that are injected with a chemical just a split second before they're uh, shot out of the helicopter. As they fall to the ground and land on the ground, they burst into flames and it allows us to apply fire to a large area all at once. Because it's on our terms, we can control what burns and what doesn't, and we can really make sure that it's a resource benefit and that it's safe for the local communities. But the danger of any fire is that it will get out of control. And as human population near forests increases, controlled burns begin to present a dilemma. Firefighters have to protect homes and property, and that makes it impossible to let nature take its course. We can't let fires burn. It's, it's just too dangerous for the firefighters and too dangerous for the public. So what we are relying on are homeowners who have homes out in the wildland to take some precautions on their own. There are no clear answers, and the paradox remains. We want healthy ecosystems, but we can't let wildfires rage out of control. Yet one thing is certain, fire will come. Fire is inevitable here, especially in West Marin. The next 
stand replacing fire may occur next year or may occur 80 years from now, but it is going to come eventually. As we continue to manage the fires in the future, we always want to be sure that we're striking a balance. The key is to get as much benefit from fire as possible. Learning to love fire is what this is going to take. When we look at fire and we realize that it's not just bad, that fire has this role, that's what allows us to adapt and use fire in the way that Mother Nature intended.